Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Manmeet Wawaya, who's going to talk today about the impact of machine-to-machine -machine communication on network traffic. There's been a big shift in terms of the traffic that's going through networks these days. Machines are now talking to machines. What's been the impact of that? So yeah, exactly. The traffic has been growing very fast, but the difference this time is that the traffic growth is happening machine to machine versus machine to user. So this is causing the very fundamentals of the networking architecture to change. It's causing the fundamentals of Surdy's architectures to change, and it's causing the speeds to go higher and higher. Is there just that much more data that is being done by the machines and raising the network traffic? Is it more than what was happening before? Absolutely. So the growth that is coming in the network right now is mostly happening because of machine to machine. The machine to user traffic is pretty much staying the same at this point. Why don't you draw this out for us? Give us some visual here. Yeah, absolutely. What are we looking at here? What, what are you seeing as the big trends? So as we said, the speeds are increasing, the traffic is increasing, and most of this traffic growth is now coming from machine to machine communication. What we are seeing here is the increasing Ethernet data rates. As you go from a typical campus enterprise network to a cloud computing provider to a telecom provider, the Ethernet data rates over time are going to increase from 100 gigabits to 200 gigabits to 400 gigabits. And really what you're getting to is that you're trying to stop the bottlenecks and the bottlenecks keep shifting, right? Exactly. So as the speeds are increasing, it's causing the network architectures to change and it is causing the FI architectures to change. And in some cases, we are now beginning to hit the laws of physics. So what do these networks look like? How do they change? Yeah. So now let's take a look at how these speeds are increasing and how these networks are changing, how these networks are evolving and what this in turn is doing to the FI technology that is supporting all this communication. Take us inside the data center. What's changing? All right, so let's take a look at this. This is a typical blade. This can be a server blade, a storage blade. It can be an accelerator card. It can be your switch blade, et cetera, et cetera. Multiple of these blades are now forming a rack. The Surdy's technology in this blade now needs to talk in a chip-to-chip -chip manner. It talks to chip-to-chip -chip at 25 gigabits per second, increasing to 50 gigabits per second, and in future, 100 gigabits per second. Now these multiple of these Multiple of these blades are now forming a rack, and in the rack you have, again, storage arrays, server arrays, accelerator cards that then talk to top of the switch rack. This is typically called as a top of the switch rack architecture, where each one of these blades is talking to the blade on the top, which is a switch blade, and these are connected either through copper cables, three or five meter copper cables, or in some cases through the optical cables. Moving along, multiple of these racks are now within a room talking to each other through optical cables. Now they have to talk room to room, building to building, forming a big data center. Do existing architectures work or do you have to put in new ones? So what is happening in the network right now is that as, as the machine to machine traffic is increasing, two key concerns need to be addressed. First is scalability and the second is latency. So the, so the very fundamentals of these architectures is changing from to what is now called as a leaf spine network. What this essentially means is that these layers of switches, the access switch, the aggregation core switch, etc., are being removed and these layers are now being reduced to what is called as the leaf switches and the spine switches. What this in turn is allowing us to do is to help have these machines directly talk to each other, make them more scalable at high speeds and reduce the latency because now they're not going through these layers of switches. So if you look at it, now networks are increasing in left to right manner versus top to bottom. What does that buy you? So what's really this is buying us is that now you can see that these machines are directly talking to each other with minimal layer of switching layers in between. In the previous example, they have to go through multiple switching layers, which adds to the latency. With this new wave of applications, like the, the AI and the machine learning, etc., it is very important to keep the latency very low. And for that reason, these reduced switch layer, or what is called as a leaf spine network, 
allows us to get to a very low latency, scalable, high bandwidth architecture. Let's go back here for a second, because what has to change in terms of the, the architectures themselves, the series, for example, how does that change to deal with the new architectures? So remember, we started with this small blade here. We said this can be a server blade, a storage blade, a switch blade. There are chips, there are high speed files inside this blade that are now communicating to each other. This can be a CPU to CPU. It can be a CPU to accelerator, a CPU to GPU, a CPU to NIC card, etc. So this is a very simple chip to chip connection. Many of these blades here are now talking to what is called as a top of the rack switch. The switch is sitting on the very top of this rack. Each one of these blades is now connected to top of the rack switch like through copper cables or through optical cables. These can be three meter copper cables or they can be five meter copper cables. Uh, now the series or the phi has to talk through copper cables, which is a pretty difficult long channel. Or the other alternative is that there is a backplane and this phi technology has to talk to the top of the rack switch through the backplanes. As we get into higher speeds, how does the phi technology have to change? Exactly. So if you look at a typical 25 gig phi, 25.78 gigabits per second to be exact, we had what is called as your typical NRZ technology. In this case, at 25.78 gigabits per second, we have a bandwidth of 1 by T and a signal to noise ratio of, let's say, A, which is our amplitude. Now, as we move to 56 gig, or to be precise for Ethernet, in case of Ethernet, it's 53 and an eighth, 53.125 gig. Uh, there are two ways to do that. If we continue to stay with the NRZ technology, my bandwidth now goes from one by two to two by two. Uh, sorry, one by T to two by T. Uh, but my signal to noise ratio stays the same as amplitude A. Now, if you look at the 53.125 gig, uh, my bandwidth is now 2 by T, and my signal-to-noise ratio is still at A. So this causes a big ISI issue, which in turn would give me very, very high channel loss. So now, now my channel becomes very tricky because, uh, because of the higher data rates. And so an alternate here is to move to a fundamentally new technology, which is called as the PAM4 technology, which is the pulse amplitude modulation. What we are essentially doing here is sending two bits for every single clock transition. So for every single clock, I am sending two bits, which are now represented as 00, 01, 10, and 11. So if you compare it to the 25 gig I, you will see my bandwidth remains the same as one by T, but my signal to noise ratio is taking a hit here. It's instead of A, it's now A by three. And that's the impact of doubling up your data rate, right? Exactly, because the networks require higher speeds, I am doubling my speed from 25 and change to 53 and change. And as the speeds are increasing, my ISI is getting to a point where we are beginning to hit laws of physics. So we are fundamentally changing the CERDES technology or the PHI technology from the NRZ to PAM4. What's the trade-off of doing that? Yeah, so the trade-off is pretty clear from these pictures. The trade-off is essentially my signal to noise ratio, which is getting hit but my, my ISI stays the same as it was in the 25 gig case. So I am trading off my, my SNR for the ISI here. What's the benefit of doing that? The, the downside of doubling the speed as we showed here is that my channel losses are very high now. My channel losses are high to a point that I will not be able to hit top of the rack copper cable type of applications. So we are, for that reason, we can take a hit on the SNR, which is approximately about 8, 9 dB at, at these speeds. So I'm, when I trade this off, I'm able to get the performance I need to meet the channels like the ones we talked about, which is the top of the rack, which is the servers and the other blades talking to the, to the top of the rack switch. And there's no loss of any data as a result of that, right? 
So the fundamentals for the PAM4 technology is that your BER is in the ratio of 10 to the power minus 6, 10 to the power minus 7 type of range. Compare that to NRZ where we had somewhere between 10 to the power minus 12 to 15. But what we need to do here is we have to use a typically a Reed Solomon RS forward error correction, which will then help me get my back, my my BER from 10 to the power minus 6, 7 to back to 10 to the power minus 12. You talked a little bit about the NRZ versus the PAM4. What do the architectures look like and how do they differ? Yeah, so let's look at this. This is our traditional 25 gig NRZ architecture. Here we have the 56 gig PAM4 architecture. Now, in the 25 gig realm, it's very standard slicer plus CDR based approach. These are our, this is a half rate architecture with one DFE tap unrolled. So we have these data high, data low slicers. We have these phase slicers here. Because this is a half-rate architecture, we are looking at two eyes simultaneously. And uh, then we have an a, a error slicer here, just collecting statistical information. To sum, up, sum it up, we need a minimum of eight slicers for a NRZ architecture. Now, take this to the 56 gig PAM4. Now we got multiple eyes here. So if you were to follow the CDR slicer approach, we would need a minimum of 20 slicers. That will be a lot of power, a lot of area, etc. cetera. Uh, so there's a fundamental shift in the architectures now. Instead of a CDR slicer, we are now going to uh, analog front end uh, plus ADC, which is your analog digital converter, plus a digital signal processing type architecture. So. What we do now is we are using uh, we're using SAR ADCs, uh, which is uh, successive approximation ADCs. But because these are these are low power, these are smaller in area. Uh, but because these are slow, we have to use multiple of these, 32 of these to be precise, in a time interleaved manner. So we use 32 of these ADCs in a time interleaved manner. What they're doing is they're digitizing each one of these eyes coming in and they're transferring all those digitized values into the digital signal processing unit. So the DSP now we are doing multi-tap FFE and DFE all in the digital domain based on the digitized values from the ADCs. So what, is it, what do engineers working in this space have to think about? What are, what's the, the next yeah. step for them? So basically this whole problem needs to be looked at holistically from the architecture level perspective basically how what's happening in the hyperscale data centers and how we address these issues. And uh, the key here is maturity, right? So the, the single most difficult block in these PAM4 series is the, or the ADC DAX. So we, we as an example, are going with silicon proven uh, ADC DAX uh, to, to make sure that, that, you know, this is a robust and a solid solution. Uh, the next thing is obviously about the latency. So we talked about the latency with the spine leaf architectures and the hyperscale for to address these new emerging wave of applications. So with the complete Ethernet solution, you know, together with the Mac, etc., uh, we are trying to solve the latency issue, which then rolls its way up into the architectural specs. Uh, so the complete solution here is extremely important. The other thing is uh, sooner or later things will move from 56 gig to 112 gig. And the way we have architected our 56 gig phi is keeping in mind that we have to move to 112 gig. So going to 112 gig is not twice as difficult, but it's twice as many blocks. As an example, the DSP doubles. Uh, now the number of ADCs are doubling. Uh, the LCOs change to quadrature LCOs so we can take four phases out of it, etc. So it's double the number of blocks. But the architecture has a lot of differentiating features, including multi-loop clock recovery, etc., that will take itself into the 112 gig very soon. And finally, I'd like to say all of these FIs are now being done in very advanced FinFET technologies. Memi, Walia, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>